It seems we have a lot of early risers. Yay! More than I expected. So <laughs> the early bird catches the six-figure Kickstarter, as they say. <laughs> so uh, my name is Paddy Finn. Some of you may have uh, already spoken to me or heard, heard me on a panel yesterday. Um, I'm, I'm not going to bore you to death with who I am and all that. That's not why you're here. You're here to learn about Kickstarter. But just a little bit, I started out with um, indie publishing uh, in 2016. I went full time at the end of 2018, uh, writing science fiction. And by the end of 2020, you know, I was making some sales, but things weren't going as well as expected, having gone full time and thinking I'd have all this extra time and being able to make all this extra money. That just wasn't the reality at that point. So things got a bit scary. I had a wife, um, two kids at the time, uh, all the bills, all the usual stuff. When I left my job, I didn't have a lot of savings or anything like that. And we got to the point where it was like, okay, $5,000 left in the bank account. And either you know, I go get a job or make some sort of miracle happen. And I figured, out, okay, I'm going to launch a box set. Um, I'd put a lot of investment and time into learning how to do book bub, uh, book bub ads and other things that people weren't really doing at that time. And I launched the box set, uh, invested that $5,000, and within a year it made $100,000. So that gave us some breathing room, and things kind of escal escalated and carried on from there. And one of those opportunities that came off the back of that was kind of looking at, give, giving me some space to look around and go, okay, um, what other opportunities are there out there? And one of those opportunities I sort of theorized on was Kickstarter. And uh, especially in the in the publishing space, right? So Kickstarter is something that is still in its infancy when it comes to publishing. Um, the market on there, when it comes to the publishing category, you know, a lot of other categories, like the ones that we started working in, uh, tabletop role-playing games, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, they're already very buoyant. They've got a lot of people in there. Uh, there's a huge chunk of the, of the Kickstarter market existing in that ecosystem. So, you know, a lot of the work has already been done. You know how to go in there. You can see, you know, the mistakes other people have made on their Kickstarters, etc. And you can learn those lessons. The published thing is it's still quite new. So obviously we have bigger players coming along now, like Brandon Sanderson, etc. Everyone talks about Brandon every time we talk about Kickstarter and publishing. And rightly so, because um, his efforts have brought a huge audience into this publishing space, right? That wasn't really there before that, right? He began with his Way of Kings 10-year uh, anniversary thing. That did really well. Um, and then the most recent one did even better. And now he's uh, working with companies in the TTRPG side of things, expanding his IP into other areas. And that's also doing really well, would you believe? Um, yeah, so the question is, how do we as indie authors want to approach Kickstarter? What do we do? How do we, what does that journey look like going from nothing on Kickstarter to seven figures or even somewhere in the middle? You, you might not want seven figures, you might want just a, a five figure one or you know, a six figure one that would see you in good stead and give you some breathing room like making that did for me back in the day. So let's see how this works. Uh, yeah, Kickstarter will change everything. Now, that might sound a bit over the top, a bit dramatic, and I do hail from the Emerald Isle, in case anyone hasn't noticed from the accent, so I am given to theatrics and blowing things out of proportion. It's just what we do. But yes, it is dramatic, and that's because it can bring about dramatic change, at least for those who are willing to invest what it needs into the platform in terms of your time, your money, your learning, etc. So if you're willing to give Kickstarter the serious amount of attention and resources that it deserves, it really can change everything. And that's what I want to, I want to get that across more than anything else, right? No matter what you're doing in publishing at the minute, um, even if you go into Kickstarter, you are kind of starting from scratch again because it is a different audience. You're going to be able to bring some of your audience over with you. But by and large, Kickstarter, and one of the great things about Kickstarter that a lot of people overlook is it's an amazing audience building tool, right? Outside of the ecosystems that we recognize like Amazon and, and wide. And coming to that, um, wide and KDP, those two options, I was um, 
chatting with Krishan earlier, um, <laughs> we had breakfast, and I was, I was saying, it's funny because when you start out in indie publishing, that there was, those are your options, right? Do I go wide? Do I go Amazon exclusive? And it's almost like you've already set boundaries to yourself, right? It's because those are your only two options. Whereas that's not the only thing. You have this dome within these boundaries, and those are your options. But outside of that, if you were willing to look outside, there are other opportunities like Kickstarter and other things. And we'll look at different ways, different paths you can take using Kickstarter from an indie publishing perspective because there are different ways to do it, and those different ways have very different approaches. And yeah, the, the story was just really about a guy called Killian Carter. Um, he was born in Northern Ireland in the middle of a civil war in the 80s that a lot of people call the Troubles. And this little guy called Killian, um, when he was born, his, yeah, he was kind of born into a family where they were so poor, all the other poor people made fun of them. So <laughs> that's how, how bad things were for Killian and his family. And then his, his family got caught up in this war and his dad went to prison um, because he was fighting for the IRA and fell on the wrong side of the government at the time. And so you kind of grew up without a father and very limited opportunities, as you can imagine. But fast forward, you know, 10 years, Killian finds himself in a cult, um, of all things. And then fast forward 20 years, Killian uh, becomes a full-time publisher after going through quite a journey and starts to make a lot of money on Kickstarter. And anyone who knows who Killian Carter is will know that that's my pen name, right? So um, I started out with Killian Carter in science fiction back in 2016. So the reason I share that story with you is because I want people to understand that regardless of what background you come from or where you are, that these things can create huge opportunities, right? And Kickstarter is insanely powerful in its potential, right? But you just need to approach it in the right way to tap into that potential. So one of the things I talk about a lot is we have Amazon and Wide and everything else, and we have Kickstarter. And the great thing about both of them is they have huge potential, right? I mean, people have made a lot of success in those areas. But the thing about Amazon is so much of that potential is already tapped, right? Kickstarter, especially in the publishing sector, not so much. And the thing is, and take this with a grain of salt, and take everything I say with a grain of salt, right? I'm not recommending that this is what you should do or that, you know, if you do it, it'll get the same results. But I will share some principles that hopefully will help you on your journey. But I have a theory that the publishing sector of Kickstarter is... We're kind of going from the innovator stage into the early adopter stage, right? And the marketing life cycle. And anyone who's familiar with that will know that it means we're to ride a wave, okay? And if you position yourself to ride that wave by becoming familiar with Kickstarter and you know, wrapping your head around it, maybe running a few test uh, campaigns and just checking it out, and learning how to make a out of a Kickstarter campaign, then you might be able to ride that wave because if you think there are other authors out there, really big authors, um, and, and they're not looking at Kickstarter and what Brandon has done with his IP, and they're not thinking the same thing, you know, well, I don't think that's true. I think there are much, there are really big authors out there looking at Kickstarter going, okay, Brandon did this thing, it was really successful, I'm going to see what my audience will do. I'm going to um, bring my romance audience to the platform. I'm going to bring my thriller audience to the platform. And I think as an ecosystem, it's going to grow. And that will provide opportunity for us. A lot of people look at Brand and go, oh, how do I do that? You know, it's way too big. I'll never be that successful. But it's actually, he's created a huge opportunity for anyone who wants to launch anything in fantasy, right? So it's just reframing it and looking at it in their positive light. All right. So... What we'll do really quickly is go through five reasons that you should run a Kickstarter. And then we'll look at three principles that kind of dives into those in a little more depth. And hopefully by the end, there will be a little time for q and I'll try and get as much time as possible for a Q&A um, because I'm sure this is such a huge <laughs> subject <laughs> that I can't really cover everything in it. And I want to make sure that I at least touch on some of the things that you want me to touch on, right? So questions is the best way to do that. Okay, one, it's easier than you think. 
And I know that's an easy thing to say <laughs> when you haven't run a Kickstarter before, but it truly is. It, it, it is easier than you think. I'm not saying it's easy. Don't get me wrong. Anything worth doing is never easy. Okay, Kickstarter does take work, but it is, you, it is easier than a lot of people tend to imagine it to be. And especially, you know, for me, I imagine it to be this difficult thing. My first Kickstarter, I learned a lot, let's say, and we'll get to that soon. Um, the second one is transparent data or data. What do you guys say here? Data? Data, data. You, you say both. Okay. I don't feel so bad. Thank you. <laughs> so transparent data. Um, this is something that we don't actually get on Amazon, right? And some other platforms are better, and some of them are, are, are like Amazon in a way. They don't really share your customer data with you. And this is a huge benefit for Kickstarter and why indie publishers should be looking at it as a solution for expanding their IP or for doing something with their existing IP. And yeah, transparent data is so powerful, and I would argue that it is, well, that and the third point. They're the two points that are the most important when it comes to Kickstarter. It's not about how much you make on there. It's about how big your audience becomes and how you can engage with that audience and the power that Kickstarter gives you in terms of audience ownership. And what I mean by that is you might publish wide, you might publish on Amazon, uh, maybe you have a big following on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, whatever, Facebook. Thing is, you don't own those audiences. Those platforms own those audiences. And that's why I'm a huge proponent of building a mailing list, something a lot of us run away from. Uh, because it isn't easy, but it's so powerful if you can build that mailing list. Because you own that. You can contact those people anytime you want and with about anything you want. On the other platforms, they get to decide who sees your stuff, right, by and large. And we, we saw that with Facebook, you know. It used to be if you had a Facebook page and you had 100,000 people following you back in the day, you posted something, everyone saw it. So you could rely on 100,000 people seeing your post and that driving traffic to whatever your promotion was. And then Facebook decided one day, whoop, we'll just turn that off because we want a slice of that pie. And if you want to reach all those people, you have to give us some money. And then we had to rely more on paid advertising. So that's because you didn't control that audience. You didn't own that audience. Kickstarter is as close as you can get to a newsletter and having that control and that power when it comes to your audience because it gives you email addresses. It gives you mailing addresses if you're doing like a physical thing. And essentially, if Kickstarter was to do something that your business didn't agree with or they did something that hurt your business, well, you still have that audience. You own that audience and that's incredible. Um, so I would say, in terms of your audience ownership, Kickstarter is up there with your newsletter and direct sales. Which brings us to four, publishing still new. I talked about this already a little bit. Because it's so new, and if I'm right and, and it is going to do what I think it's going to do, then now is the perfect time to start doing it, right? Don't wait until 10 years down the line and look back on the people who have done really well on Kickstarter and go, oh, I really wish I'd started on Kickstarter when Patty told me to back in 2022 in Vegas, right? Don't put yourself in that position. We've all done it. I've done it. You know, I, I look back and go, I wish I had listened to this person and published my novel back in the day and, you know, made my series bigger, et cetera, et cetera. Don't have that regret. Kickstarter, going back to the first one, it's easier than you think. Try it out. Test it. Experiment with a small Kickstarter first. We'll touch on that more later. And get it going now. I mean, I, I, this lady here, what's your name again? Alicia. Alicia. Alicia came up to me and she said that she set up her Kickstarter yesterday after listening to a panel on Kickstarter. And that really excites me. That's amazing because she's about to tap into this huge potential, right? And if she taps into it and carries on and gives it that investment that it requires, it can change everything, as we looked at in the beginning. So I challenge you all to run a Kickstarter starting tonight. Or at least, <laughs> if you haven't already got a, an account, go and create one when you get back to your room later. And think about running one by the end of the year. New opportunities, I'll not go too much into this, but Kickstarter creates all sorts of opportunities in terms of you know, paperbacks, hardcovers, expanding your IP, or just making a lot more money on your current work, your eBooks, your digital assets than you currently are, your audiobooks, etc. Um, and that's a whole other talk on its own, but 
just know that once you start your Kickstarter career, and I want you to think of it as a career and a long-term thing rather than a do one Kickstarter and that's it, because when people do that, it's so sad. It's such a pity because they're not tapping into that potential we spoke about. So once you do that, though, and you start on your career, you'll get like a few Kickstarters in and start noticing all these opportunities. And you're like, oh, well, what if I do this? And I didn't know I could make money doing that. That's a different thing. And you start to be able to engage in different ways with people. And yeah, it's, it, it's really exciting. Uh, you can get uh, caught up in this whirlwind, which I've gotten caught up in in the last years. And it's a roller coaster ride. <laughs> So that's five reasons, very quickly. Three principles we'll go into in a little bit more depth. Um, let's see, okay. And I wanna make sure I do leave plenty of time at the end, so we'll see how far we get through this. Fear shows the way. Okay, like I said earlier, you can get caught up in this sort of, I, I guess, limiting belief that you have these two options, Amazon wide. I challenge you to look outside of that, outside of your comfort zone. When you look at Kickstarter, and you think, oh, that's a lot to learn. Oh, that's, you know, I'm already doing enough. I'm trying to learn marketing for my novels, my eBooks. I'm trying to learn how to do Amazon ads, Facebook ads, BookBub ads, you know, newsletters, uh, all these things. How can I possibly take Kickstarter on board? This is insane. And what I would say to that is that's a fearful response. And when you have a fearful response, when it comes to something that can help make you successful, Often that fear is actually a signpost going, you should go this way. So listen to that voice of doubt and listen to it really well and then do the opposite, right? Do that Kickstarter. Don't be afraid, as I'm gonna show you if I get to it on time. It's, it's not that scary. Fear of the approval button. Okay, so just a little quick story on my own fear of Kickstarter. I launched my first Kickstarter in February of 2021. And I'd kind of been building it up in my head as this scary, phantom, unknown thing. And we do have this fear of the unknown. It's just a natural human reaction. And, but I was so fearful of it. There's this button. The process of Kickstarter is you create your account, you set up a campaign, uh, you fill in a bunch of details, and then you get to the stage where it's like, submit for approval. And I didn't know what that meant. I was like, and no matter how many resources I read, they didn't tell me, right? So I actually hired someone and paid them a lot of money to tell me, what does this approval button do? And they were really good and really gracious. And it's a guy called Dave Lake. I actually still work with him. Um, he's a great marketing guy. And he, he kind of like just held my hand and went, Patty, if you hit the button, the approval button, this is what happens. Don't be afraid. And even though he told me that, I was like, yeah, but what if this happens? What if that happens? And, ah. and I hit the approval button and what he said happened and it, just went, boop, approved. <laughs> right? No confetti. There was, con no, the confetti was when you launch. Yeah. Actually, I wanted to launch a Kickstarter here, but Kickstarter didn't approve the campaign on time. <laughs> I wanted to do hit launch and see that little confetti thing. Oh, well. Um, yeah, but, but the short of it is, don't be afraid of it, right? I mean, it is a song known. And I, I, I built this approval button up so much in my head that it just freaked me out. And I, was, I went out of my way to pay someone money to help me out there. Just hit approve. Because when you hit approve, it doesn't launch your Kickstarter. That comes later. Hitting approve just gives you a link, a pre-launch link. Think of it as a pre-order, right? That you can send people to to follow your Kickstarter so that when you do launch, they get a notification and they back you, which is very important when it comes to marketing, right? So hit that approval button as soon as you can. I wish I'd hit mine sooner. Principle two, big ideas deserve small beginnings. What does that mean? Okay, I get a lot of people coming to me and they're, Patty, I've got a big idea. And it's gonna go up on Kickstarter. And it's gonna do really well because I know people will love this idea. And I'm like, okay, that's great. Take that big idea and set it over there, right? because this is your first Kickstarter. And sometimes maybe they've run a few Kickstarters, but it was a long time ago, or maybe they just had limited success, and they didn't really learn as much as they could have in those Kickstarters. And what I say is, okay, see, see that big idea, set it aside, and take something that's related to that idea, and launch that as your first Kickstarter instead. And, you know, in novels, that could be a short story, it could be a novella, it could even just, it could be even simpler than that when you're experimenting and doing your first Kickstarter. It could be a, a bit of flash fiction. It could be 
a sample chapter in a book, you go, hey guys, here's a sample chapter. I wanna write the rest of this book, but I can't afford editing or book covers or anything like that. Do you wanna jump on board and let's write a book together? And you'd be surprised how many people are like, yes, I'll jump on board. I've been wanting to write a book for years. I'm never going to do it. You're doing it. I wanna live vicariously through you and your writing of a book because that will make me feel like I'm writing a book. Okay, and that's, that's the thing you're tapping into on a Kickstarter, which a lot of people also don't look at. Thing is, a lot of people use it as a sales platform where they sell their products and that's fine, but the real, the secret sauce of a Kickstarter is tapping into higher up on the hierarchy of needs. It's not tapping into the need for clothing, food, shelter, etc. It's not even really tapping into the need for entertainment and sheltering from the, the proverbial storm, right? And, and getting into another world, away from this world. It's actually tapping into, you know, being bigger than, just being part of bigger something than you, right? Belonging to a community, being part of a project that creates something awesome and knowing that you made that happen and you were there in the beginning. And when you come to it with that approach and you frame your Kickstarter campaign using that language, it can, it can have a, a much deeper impact on people because you know, they wanna be involved in something. Even subconsciously, they might not even realize it, but if you use the right language, you can get people there for the right reasons. Okay, so what I would say then is once you've launched your Kickstarter, your mini one, a little sample experiment, whatever, you're going to make a lot of mistakes, okay? And give your permission to make those mistakes. No matter what I tell you, no matter how many times you speak to me or someone else who's run a bunch of Kickstarters, you're still gonna make mistakes, and that's okay. Especially because you're doing it on the tiny Kickstarter, right? Your big idea deserves better than a whole bunch of mistakes. And that's why you wanna keep your big idea for the second Kickstarter. And you're still gonna make mistakes on that. You know, we're always learning. But you're gonna make fewer mistakes and hopefully smaller mistakes and give it the chance it actually deserves. Uh, so I'll give you an example, using myself as a case study, uh, looking at my first on Kickstarter briefly. So you need some water. Man, Vegas is so dry. I come from a country where it rarely drops below 80% humidity. <laughs> and it rains all the time. Okay, my first and second Kickstarter. I want you to look at my first one. And again, take all these numbers with a pinch of salt. And, you know, I'm not, not able to cover everything I did to make this happen. Um, I'm happy to talk to people later or whatever. Reach out to me if you want to speak. I'm more than happy to always talk shop. But this is the first one we, we ran. So I, I had that success in uh, science fiction. I wrote a military science fiction series, did very well. However, I then, I was a big, let's say, let's say a big believer in Dungeons and Dragons. I'm gonna use the word believer because I think pe Dungeons and Dragons is something a lot of people don't realize it is. Um, it, it's, so, it's so powerful as a medium, right? Role playing games, and it helps. It's just collective storytelling. It's, it's writing a book, writing a story. Only the dungeon master or the game master is a narrator and the other people around the table play the characters and you write the story together. And it's a wonderful experience because unlike other forms of entertainment like Netflix or even reading a novel where you're consuming something beautiful and creative, you're actually engaged in an active creation as a group of people. So it fulfills this innate human desire um, to, to create that a lot of people don't get. And I think that's why it's grown in such popularity over the last few years is people are getting more into the creative side of things. All that aside, it was a nice segue into this market because, and we'll look at this later in expanding your IP beyond novels, um, because you know, write, we, we write stories. That's what we do, for some of us are living or we're, we're thinking of writing stories. So we, we're already in that mindset, so it's just, it's not a huge leap to go into another story medium. Anyway, I launched my first Kickstarter. It made approximately 4,000, that says pounds, that's meant to be a dollar sign. $4,000, which is you know, 209, uh, 2,900 pounds at the time. Um, the conversion rate is much worse now, which is why I set up a company in Austin, Texas last month, <laughs> because I get money from the audience here going over to the United Kingdom, I lose out on the exchange rate, and then I have to pay all of my sponsors and advertisers who also live over here, so I'm like getting hit with a double whammy. Anyway, that aside, 274 backers, 
and notice that it was funded on March the 3rd, 2021. So at the end of 2022, I had this idea and I realized, Patty, you don't know anything about Kickstarter. What are you thinking? Launch something smaller first, make mistakes, see what happens, test the boundaries, right? And then see if the big one for after. And something that your, your smaller Kickstarter should tick a bunch of boxes. It shouldn't be a huge investment. Okay, it should be something that you don't put a lot of money and effort into in the beginning. It's just you put it up there and the idea is it's an investment in your learning, which is number two, it allows you to make those mistakes and to learn from them. And number three is you're gonna build a small audience off of it. If that's 10 people that backed your stuff, awesome. If it's 300 people, awesome. Those people are gonna hear about your next Kickstarter and they could potentially back that too. And that's really powerful. So I did launch it, I made a lot of mistakes. I actually spent $4,000 on this thing and may, it cost me $5,000 to run the entire thing. And that was okay because I, I did that intentionally. I knew I was going into it and testing a lot of boundaries with my marketing and spending more to see, well, where is the sweet spot, right? And I'm very aggressive in my growth strategy as you'll see, which is why I'm, uh, I did six, seven figures since then. But if we look at the second Kickstarter, notice when it was funded, May the 8th, 2021. So that's two months later, right? And instead of making four figures, it made approximately $113,000, right? And the backers, which is again, a most important number that we often overlook. 1,366. So you can see that my audience is growing. I added about 1,000 people here. And every time you launch a Kickstarter and you launch one this big, you think about that, you're, you're adding 1,000 people. If you, if you run three or four of these a year, you've added 4,000 people, right? If you do that another year, you're close to 10,000, so on and so forth. Uh, so when I say it's an audience building platform, I'm not kidding. And these people are motivated people they're already on the platform. They've backed Kickstarters before, most likely. And they're kind of like the perfect audience for you if you want to make something of Kickstarter. So again, this only took two months of a difference. Now, there's a lot of things going on in the background, like I said, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, but the point is, you learn all your mistakes at the beginning. On the next Kickstarter, you, you don't make as many mistakes. You give that big idea the chance it deserves, and it can do much better than it would have if you did that first. All right. And then coming back to this, don't waste your great idea on your first Kickstarter. Like I said, it deserves better. Run one tonight or when you get home. That challenge again. Okay, front-loading effort generates momentum. And I wanted to put this in here. It's, it's, it's a bit of a strange principle in the industry overall, but it's more uh, using Indie publishing is a reference, right? Because we all know sort of how to do things on Amazon or we've heard about it a lot, so we have an idea. And I wanna compare an Amazon launch as a point of reference to a Kickstarter launch because they're very, very different. And the approach for launching into these different platforms, it can be, they're opposite, right? And what I mean by that is, when you launch something on Amazon, you don't want a big spike at the beginning, right? We always hear that, don't make a big spike at the beginning. Amazon algorithm does not like spikes, okay? It likes a launch with a gentle curve that keeps going up and up. And then if you kind of like stop your promotions, if you did the right thing, you, you targeted the right audience, you can stop your promotions and it'll continue growing for a while. And eventually it'll peter off and create like this end curve, right? Kickstarter loves spikes. In fact, it wants all of your traffic on day one and day two. So the first 48 hours are very important. And then you end up usually with a big spike at the end because a whole bunch of people are going to follow your campaign. And when it gets to the end, they're going to realize, oh, it's run I'm running out of time. I need to back this. You know, they've been putting it off for a month or a week or whatever. And you get the spike. So you get the, you invert that N and you end up with a U because there's a big spike at the beginning. In the middle of the Kickstarter, I think my friend Russell calls it the dead zone. Uh, Russell and Monica, right? You get this dead zone and we kind of differ in opinion here, which is great. We're all at different opinions, right? Um, Russell, will, will kinda, Russell and Monica give you tools to sort of help you keep things going in the middle. 
my belief is that you should ignore the middle. You, you focus all of your effort on the first two days of launch, and when you hit that big down swing in the middle, don't do anything. Just sit back and ride it, ride it out, right? Um, because you can, you can put effort into that, into this down swing, but the returns on that effort are going to be minuscule compared to the effort that you can put into the first two days, right? So it, it almost doesn't make sense to, to do that at all. I learned that the hard way. I used to like just get so worked up and frustrated about, you know, why, why, why can't I make more stuff happen in the middle of this Kickstarter? And it's like, well, that's just how the platform works. So don't worry about it. So the most important two days, I, I made this comment yesterday, and <laughs> it came across as a bit negative, which is, wasn't my intention, um, which is, I, I say there are two most important days on a Kickstarter. The second most important day is the day of launch. And the first most important day is every day before that. Because unlike Amazon, again, you kind of want your promotions to be spread out over the course of you know, two weeks, whatever. You get you know, a newsletter swap, a bunch of ads, um, hopefully a big bub share at some point, whatever. Kickstarter wants everything on day one, and day two is also fine. So you need to ex put a, a lot of effort in before your Kickstarter to make that happen, right? You need to build your list, make sure they're aware of the Kickstarter coming up, um, and then be able to hit that list on day one. You need to, if you want to do promotions or sponsorships, I would, you know, look on, looking at places like YouTube, again, thinking outside the box, right? How many of us as authors sponsor YouTube videos? I don't know, but I don't think there's that many people doing it. We do it a lot, and it works really, really well. Um, but yeah, so if you want to line all that up, you have to do a lot of work before the Kickstarter to make sure it all coincides with the launch, right? And Kickstarter is a don't fund. This is where the negativity of my comment yesterday kind of comes into it, and that is, if you get to the end of your Kickstarter and you haven't funded, or even if you get halfway through and you haven't funded, I, I sometimes get this question, which is, what do I do to make it, to pick things up, to make it fund? And I usually would say, don't. Cancel your Kickstarter. Go back to the drawing board. You've learned a few mistakes there, right? Learn from them, apply your lessons, and launch again. Because if your Kickstarter doesn't, I would never want someone to feel like they should, they should stop using Kickstarter as a platform. No, they should view it as a learning opportunity. And the reason I say you should kind of cut your losses halfway through is because if you haven't really funded in the first half of your Kickstarter, if you have only hit half of your goal, let's say you wanted $1,000, and by the middle of your Kickstarter you've only hit $500, the chances of you hitting that other $500 is very low. Right? Because the spike at the end is almost always, there are exceptions, but almost always much, much smaller than the spike in the beginning. Right? So if you think about that logically, you're not going to hit that $500 that you need that you got in the beginning. So it's better to cut your losses, regroup, figure out what went wrong. Maybe you realize, actually, do you know what? I need to set my sights a bit lower. Instead of $20,000, let's try $1,000 first. Maybe I didn't bring enough audience to the table on day one, because the bigger the audience you bring to the table, the bigger the audience Kickstarter will bring to the table on day one as well, right? Two paths. Mm, what do we like for time? Okay, 10 minutes, great. I'll be very quick here then, because this is really important when it comes from an, and the author perspective, the question is, okay, well, Paddy, you've convinced me. I'm gonna run a Kickstarter, or I, I, I already wanted to come I came here because I, I'm running one anywhere. I, I'm going to run one. Um, what, what does that look like? What is my road? And there are kind of like two things that you should look at. Number one is you can use your existing catalog. You can use your existing content to put that on Kickstarter, right? Think about Brandon Zanderson and what he did with his first big Kickstarter on um, what was the Way of Kings 10-year anniversary edition. It was like a leather bound. He did a bunch of options like signed and unsigned. He was recycling existing material, right? He took something he'd written or had published 10 years before, and he republished it, essentially, on Kickstarter. You can do something like that, right? It doesn't have to be, you have to create a new product. It could be you could take something you already have, and you can use that. Or you can 
continue to build on a series or expand that series in the audiobooks and other things. That brings us to the second path, which is not working with what you currently have, but extending that into different markets, right? Turning it into a movie, right? Or a television series like my friend Jonathan Yanez did. He launched a Kickstarter, and I can't remember how much it did, but it did enough for them to shoot a pilot of a television series. I think it was like a science fiction series. Um, and they now have, I believe, some sort of agreement to, to write the rest of the series and to create the rest of the series, and that they've worked through the different channels to do that. And, and that all began with jump-starting it on Kickstarter. You could write a tabletop role-playing game. I know a few of you in the audience are doing that, right? You're doing things for Dungeons & Dragons or a different system. You could com com create a comic book, right? Comic books, people love comic books and graphic novels on Kickstarter. There's a huge community there. So. I challenge you to think about how to expand your existing IP also. Not just to keep working on the IP and the market that you currently operate in, expand that. Yeah, those are the two points. And I'm going to open it to you guys. Do you have any questions? Oh, yes, Thank and if you so do have a question, can you please uh, go use the microphone in the middle of the room? Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Patty. Um, yesterday we were talking about doing the um, Amazon pre-order at the same time or actually before you start the Kickstarter. So how do you promote? Like when you promote to your, your followers, do you promote them simultaneously? Do you kind of ignore the Amazon pre-launch? What, what's your strategy? Um, it depends on who you ask. You're going to get a very different answer, right? But if you're asking me, which you are, <laughs> I would say keep them completely separate. Those are two very different audiences, right? Right. Um, so, for example, when I made the leap from uh, indie publishing into Kickstarter, none of my audience know about this other thing, right? And mm -hmm. I would recommend you keep it that way because even though in Kickstarter you don't have to worry about also bots, so you know you can send any, you don't, you know, data purity isn't a thing. Just send everyone there. Send your family, your friends, anyone who will listen. They'll back your kick. That'll back your Kickstarter. That's fine, but. There could be a bit of a kickback on that where you have people coming through depending on what you launch and they start looking at, you know, if you try to mix them up, it could spoil things on the Amazon side of it. It's just a theory, but I would, I haven't mixed those audiences and I've seen good results, so that's all I can really speak right. to. But do you put energy into both of those though? Oh yeah, I mean, it, it depends. It depends on what you're looking for. I mean, what I would do is, I would, I would try and put as much energy into Kickstarter as possible, right? Yeah. Because that's what's going to create the product. Right. And so those people deserve more of your attention. But at the end of the day, it actually comes down to your preference. You know, where do you want the biggest impact to be? Do you mm -hmm. want it to be on Amazon or do you want it to be on Kickstarter? Yeah. And I would actually recommend having your pre-order there, um, but like, don't really even send, do, do whatever the maintenance is to send people to it, but try, and, try not to split your focus too much because if you do that, then you, you do... You don't do either of them that well, right? Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. So I was really excited to hear you say that in the middle you just sit back and do nothing because I'm kind of lazy. Um, <laughs> but it seems like most Kickstarters, they kind of default to 30 days. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, have you experimented with doing shorter ones since you've taken that sit back? Yeah, we do Kickstarters that are two weeks, 10 days, one week. Um, most of them do, the bigger campaigns are 30 days long, and we tend to run now two big campaigns a year um, with a bunch of smaller ones around that. So that's a great question because, you know, you, you might be looking at your first Kickstarter and going, 30 days, that's a long time. That's a pretty big commitment. Set it at seven days, right? Set it for three days, okay? Now, obviously, the, the shorter it is, the, the more limited the results you're going to have. Right? And, and the more limited the opportunities that you, you to send traffic to that you're going to have. But remember, the first Kickstarter is a, a more of a learning experience, right? And it isn't going to be this huge thing. Or at least you should manage your expectations and not expect it to be this huge thing. And it's often good to maybe just get that out of the way quicker. Um, so 100%. Um, smaller Kickstarters definitely have utility. Thank you. You're welcome. As uh, far as like updating backers and potential backers, have you noticed kind of a pattern of that? Do you follow like the U-graph on giving updates as well? Yeah, so giving updates is 
It serves several purposes. Obviously, you, you, you can use it to update, but also people think that it, it can feed into the algorithm. So you'll see this often on, uh, more often on the publishing side of things because it's still new, unless so on other more buoyant markets. But you can get something called the Projects We Love badge, right? And that often comes from, you know, Kickstarter have looked at your project and they really like what you're doing and they believe in it and think it's going to resonate well with their audience. But also people think that uh, you can have an impact on that by doing updates and uh, engaging with your community that you're building on Kickstarter in the comments on the updates. So it can serve that purpose. But it, it also serves the purpose of updating people. So what I would do is if you're running a Kickstarter, um, you know, once you launch, create an update. It's a great way to go, hey guys, this is what we're doing. Thanks for coming, yada, yada, yada. And then maybe every time you hit a stretch goal or a milestone, right, you hit $1,000. Oh, thank, wow, I did not expect to hit $1,000. You guys are amazing, so we're excited to create this product with you and to be on this journey with you because that's what, that's what they're there for, to be on a journey with you. And then maybe, you know, have one obviously at the end. So kind of like all the, all the milestones. And then after that, you might want to, depending on how long it's going to take you to fulfill, I would say anytime something significant happens in your, you know, creation process, share that with them. Um, and at least give them an update once a month after the Kickstarter. Um, some might ask you, oh, I, I, well, that's not enough. I want, I want one update a week. And I, my answer to them is, if I do that, I can either you know, update you, you know, several times a month, or I can work on the product, right? And even then, I don't have that many updates. I only have one a month. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, I've actually already run my first Kickstarter, which was successful. I'm getting ready to run my bigger idea here more towards the spring. And I was wondering if you have found um, what works better in terms of how long that pre-launch page is up and the length of time to collect people so that when you do launch, that spike is as high as you can possibly make it if there's a sweet spot you've found. Okay, there isn't a sweet spot, but it can be a really good indicator of the success of your Kickstarter, right? The pre-launch page is so useful as a tool. And especially on your second Kickstarter, I recommend that everyone uses it. Um, essentially, the bigger the number you have there, the bigger the number you're going to expect on your launch, right? Mm -hmm. But there are no hard and fast numbers. There's so many, uh, there's so many factors, right? We can't like really say it's go, you know, if you have 10,000 uh, followers, it's going to translate to this much in your pledges. But essentially, launch the pre-launch as soon as possible, get it as big as possible, and that's going to ease things when it comes to the launch itself. Okay, we've got two minutes, so. I'll try to be quick. Thank you. Um, do you have any tips or resources on uh, calculating how much you're gonna need just for, to get everything mailed out, especially if you're not in the United States, or how much everything's gonna cost so you don't end up? Okay, yeah. so what I would do is reach out, or set up a, an account with BackerKit Launch, right? Um, and BackerKit Launch will kind of give you a rough idea to, to start with, it'll say, okay, if you wanna make this much, this is what your average pledge needs to be, and this is how many backers you need, right? So it calculates that first, which is what you kind of need to begin with. Then I would reach out to people, like, if you, if you want to ship physical products, number one, if you're doing, like, up to 300 products, you can kind of do it yourself, right? It's a lot of work, but it's kind of hard to figure out when do I start getting someone else to do this for me. Um, then once it does get a bit bigger, reach out to people like Nord Games, Bridge Distribution, Game Quest, for international stuff, the other two are, are in the US, and ju or just look up fulfillment companies that are close to you or abroad, and look in the community to see what's working for other people, and those people will be able to direct you the best when it comes to those things. Thanks. You're welcome. We got, we got time for one more question. Have you found that it works uh, well for, for instance, for doing translations? Is there, a, like, I want to get my books translated into German, and um, is there a strong market in Germany? Um, my short answer is, I don't know. <laughs> <That's> um, <fair. laughs> I, I honestly don't know. And I, my, my uh, virtual assistant is German, and we're kind of looking into that ourselves right now, but I haven't looked into it enough to be able to give you an answer, so... I don't want to be saying something that, uh, and misleading anyone. But that's us. Thanks very much, guys, for coming along. And all the best with your Kickstarter.